Carl Miller and Jesse Hahn. Thank you so much. And part of our education was through the junior college system. So yay, back home. Um, <laughs> so um, so the Grin Labs, all, what I'll do is just sort of walk you through each entity and a little bit about, about uh, myself. And then Jessie can introduce herself. Um, so the Grin Labs is uh, the Global Retail Insights Network. It was started almost a decade ago. And I was working in. Um, basically payments and money management for e-commerce companies. And I would travel the world and I would be brought into these meetings and all the brands and retailers would, you know, they'd exhaust their payments and money management questions. But then the questions would be about logistics and marketing and, you know, customer acquisition, all these different things. And I realized, wait a second, they, nobody really has any idea what's going on and how helpful would it be if we could actually learn from what just happened in that other meeting. So I started the Grin Labs to, to create a membership community of brands and retailers and vendors from all around the world. And we run these things called Leadership Labs, where we get 20 to 25 brands in a room, and they collaborate. So anywhere from you know, the Burberries to the Coaches to the Nikes to the Levi's, all the way down to the uh, movement watches and some of the cooler, hipper sort of pure plays as well, where they're all sitting there you know, trying to figure out, oh, should we go? You know, in this certain exercise, should we go to Japan, China, or you know, uh, Switzerland? You know, and things like that. So it's highly collaborative, and we're going to try to bring a little bit, of that, a little bit of that spirit uh, to our exploration here today. Um, and then Project Alive, maybe you can share about Project Alive and yeah. a little bit of your history. So Project Alive is so we're entrepreneurs ourselves. We started that just about a year and a half ago. Um, in partnership to work. So Project Live is a for-profit consulting um, agency, and we work as a flex organization. So the two of us are at its helm as partners, um, and we work with all different um, clients around the world. And then we expand our organization with our partners at whatever we see our clients need. So we work with it at the executive level to help be kind of an extension of the strategic planning and. Um, uh, the executive arm of the business, whatever they're going through. Primarily, they're going through some kind of change, whether they're a small retail brand that's looking to grow and go into different global markets, or they're an old retail brand that's trying to get onto, you know, being more sustainable and thinking about their su supply chain and how they can um, potentially go down a more earth first realm. Um, and then also with um, just other companies and organizations that are going through big flips, big change managements with personnel, things like that. So Carl's background is, of course, in, in payments, e-commerce, and all those pieces of it. And mine's completely opposite. Um, I worked, I, I've worked uh, with the people side of business for the last 15 years. So I started my career doing a lot of learning and training and that kind of thing, moving up through um, executive coaching and programs and now Really, Carl works with all of the business logistics stuff, and I'm like, well, we got to put people in there to make that work. So we work really well together because our skills are very opposite. Um, <laughs> but we're learning from each other, so now we're getting more. It's well amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, on the people side, it was because one of the things that would happen we'd go to these leadership labs. It didn't really matter how good your tactics, your strategy were as to, to going global if you didn't have the right leadership that really got it um, and that had the startup mentality basically none of this stuff would work. So it's a great collaboration in that way where we're still helping these companies go global, but now we're also focusing on the people side of the business, which is exciting, especially globally, because you have all these cultures and stuff and you really need to understand and have compassion for those that you're selling to in these different countries. So we sat down with, um, with this client and they wanted, their, their mission is to create something that is, uh, that allows people to, um, uh, have them have a green home, have a, be a sustainable home. And there's so many words out there. I actually feel like even sustainable is like almost on its way out and there's something even newer. So please, with your bright minds, just shout words out at us. <laughs> um, but basically, these were the things that we, kn we know about a su successful brand in this market that wants to start. So we know that they need to be thinking way farther down the road than just here in the right now. This is something you guys probably have already talked about a lot in your courseware. Um, and as a culture, you know, what we are trying to do is have more self-expression with the things we're spending money on today. So it's not just a label, but it has to identify with us a little bit deeper. And what we're also looking at is, you know, today it's all about, you know, fitting in or belonging. But what 
what we're what we're seeing the trending is that it has to really matter. So this comes down to like this alignment piece with how we spend our dollar, um, and we're moving into. Um, we want this in, you know, everything that we're doing in our lives. So this is not just, um, it's not just so transactional anymore. It's like, it's part of our entire being. So it's how we, how we spend time, how we, what we eat, what we shop, what we wear, where we go, how we go to those places. All of these things are starting to be a little bit more methodical. And so if we're not thinking that far down the road, then we're probably going to miss the mark and this isn't going to be successful. So we, we kind of took the, this kind of, framework, um, and you can go ahead and click through, um, and decided this is what we need to do. So we wanted to create some sort of product um, for people to have a sustainable home or sustainable day-to-day -day kind of experience. Um, and we wanted it to be something that nobody else was doing. Um, at least we knew that that was the first parameter. Um, and we wanted it to be from utility to lifestyle. So. You guys know what a lifestyle brand is. What does that mean to you guys? Just shoot, like, what is the name of the first one that comes to mind? Healthy. Healthy? But an actual, an actual brand, so that's a lifestyle, but like a brand that's in the lifestyle space. Yeah? Uh, what's her name? The billionaires who went to jail. Uh, Martha Stewart. Oh, Martha Stewart, yeah. sure. That's a great example. <laughs> Anyone else? Lululemon. <laughs> yeah, great. So what makes it lifestyle to you? Um, it's, well, I, I have some sort of a cynical view on that term, lifestyle oh, okay. brand. Um, I raised Lululemon as one example because it's a very high end, as far as the cost is concerned, product. Mm. It's designed to get consumers to think that's, you know, part of their health regime. Mm -hmm. um, when in reality, it's like not really necessary to be healthy, but people who have a lot of money can spend, you know, $150 on a pair of yoga pants, for example, mm -hmm. and that's marketed as, as a health benefit. Okay, and so then how do they, how do they market that? Like, what's the difference? Is there a brand, by the way, that you do like that you would think <laughs> easier to talk about? Um, well, I like their brand. I just yeah. think it's like way overpriced yeah. for what it so is. So they're using a bit of storytelling yes. to make you feel like if you buy these super expensive yoga pants, then you'll actually be healthier and um, and experience it in that way. So um, you need so that that's where this thing comes out. It's like it's not about you know aspirations anymore. It's about like being different, being a part of this other lifestyle. Another one that's really come in um, to play. What is the one we were just working with? Is it Huckberry? This is like a men's specific. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Um, so they do. They sell like all of these really expensive curated products that are very, like to a very specific male demographic, but then they do tons of storytelling. So they're gonna sell like a brand new Filson bag. It's like the story of how that bag went down to Patagonia and then it went up to, you know, like it went out to, you know, Australia and then how they swam to the Great Barrier Reef. And it's like all of the adventure around that bag. And so they're selling like the experience and the identification but also you can buy the bag, but it's all the storytelling around it. So, so me, well, I'll give another example yeah. real quick is like Samsung, they, they still sort of advertise on features, right? Oh, there's got a curve and you can, you know, read your emails on the side of your phone and stuff like that, right? I don't know what, this, I don't know what it really is, but, and then Apple, what they're doing is they're definitely about lifestyle and, and they're really like pulling at your heart and what you are. I think that it's interesting here because the context of the word different in the context of what we're gonna be talking about today are those people that um, those people know um, people that are really triggered into you know wanting to care for the earth you know people that are absolutely part of the the sort of the movement of you know hey this is this is our home and so when you know depending on the market that you're going after in this case different is really about that sensibility yeah so it's a pretty big task to change the focus from instead of you know showing up to the customer, revealing yourself to the customer. You want the customer, you want to reveal the customer to themselves. And so that's what this sort of holistic lifestyle, experiential branding is all about, is for them to create, to like sort of find their identity in that experience. So that's the direction things are going. Um, okay, so with our, our current client, who shall not be named, <laughs> uh, they, this is their problem, they want it, they, they want, they know that people want to take steps 
to live in a more sustainable way in their day-to-day -day lives, but some of them just don't know where to start. There's some other barriers. So this was sort of the condensed version. And when you're making like problem solution statements, you guys have done that with certain portions of this. So you're creating these problems. <coughs> so we, we, we do an extensive workshop with them where we really outline all of the problems that they think they're solving for. And not even thinking about the actual solution yet, but just what are all these problems? And then what are the trends? And where can we condense and get down to the core problem so that we can get into this business model and start create testing? Because that's really ultimately what we want to do is see if something's viable. So this is what we got to. But some of the other pieces around it came into um, affordability. You know, We want to be thinking about Earth first. And sometimes that comes with a price tag that's really not approachable. Um, and we also need it to be, we get very, you know, um, comfortable with, our, with how we do things and the conveniences and sometimes doing things conveniently in the way we've always done them isn't always thinking about the planet first, right? And there's not a sustainability to that. Um, and it's not also just about the earth, but it is also about cost over time. So this is sort of through that exercise we came up with this. Um, more condensed problem statements. So we want to take steps in a sustainable way to, uh, in our day-to-day -day lives, but we don't know where to start, okay? So this is our problem. So the solution we came up with is that through um, all of these different avenues of where to start, we thought about starting with the home because it's where I ideally we're spending time, it's what we care about the most, and it doesn't matter if you own the home or you're sharing it with other people, renting it, and if it's one studio or, or a large mansion, either way, we wanted to curate, so we know that these products, they don't want to create the actual products. They want to know how to get access to them and how to, um, I guess, filter the products to find the ones that are, are um, meeting the standards. So curate a sustainable home starter kit for the most highly consumed products. So before we click through, what, what does that mean, highly consumed products in the home? What would that mean to you guys? What would those look like? Food products. Food products, toilet paper. toilet paper, that's great. So this starter kit, here's just an example, and this is just really a rough list of some of the things, some of these types of products that we would put in there. So not necessarily um, uh, brand specific, but I actually learned a lot. I didn't even know this existed. This is just like a fun fact. Have you guys heard of these? They're like toothpaste pods. So you know like toothpaste comes in a plastic tube, right? So that's also a, a tough thing to recycle and it's you know using materials that are obviously limited. Um, and so they come in this little glass jar and they're these little like pods. And I tried one actually because I had to order it. I had to figure it out. And um, you just, you bite it and then it like oh, a little bit of water in your mouth and it turns into toothpaste in your mouth. And then to refill that, you just keep that jar once and then they send it in like recyclable paper, they send you refill pods. So you just have sort of a subscription. I was totally not down with it. And now I love it. And I'm obsessed with it. And it's so great for travel. I travel all the time. And I always have carry on. And this is like one more thing that's not liquid. I'm really excited. About. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I just wanted to share. That. And just a fun little uh, fun little one here. There's, you know, coffee cups that we all get from the coffee store when we're getting our coffee or whatever. Those are single use cups, right? Because we throw them away when we're done. Let's just guess how many single use cups are thrown away globally every year? Billion. 600 billion. Isn't that crazy? It's ridiculous. I just got one today. Yeah, there we go. No, I, just as a visual aid. No, just visual kidding. aid. I mean, what are we going to do with it? Also, there's so many things. Yeah. So that's just an interesting one because it's, it's also about you know caring from not just internally into your home, but also carrying some of these products into your broader community and how you can have the sensibility around sustainability there as well. Okay, so these are, this is just an example of some of this, and we'll come back to this slide. So what we did is we created um, a sort of a light business model canvas. So you guys have seen this layout before, and that, I believe that was your, your homework assignment was to sort of read this chapter. Um, so you can see there's a couple of areas that are not filled in here. Um, but C Carl, do you want to just walk through what yeah. we did end up putting in? Absolutely. So usually I'll just sort of walk through how I see business model canvases. Everybody, you know, people do them a little bit differently. But I always start with customer segments because it's pretty easy to define. So what you do, and it's a great way to start to tell the story. And one of the things you want to do when you're developing your business model canvas is allow it to tell your story. So whether you're hiring somebody and you're talking about your business, 
you know, this is a great place to sort of share with them the flow of your entire business on one page. And so here you have your customer segment. So in this case, we just said, okay, there's homeowners and then there's next gen renters who care. You know, so basic, you know, some, a few customer segments here. And then what I like to do is jump to the value propositions, right? So what, what is it that this business is, how is it helping these next gen renters who care? Well, it, 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 in the, there's a value of it for them is that it's reducing their environmental impact, which has some social value for them with their friends and their community. It saves them time and money potentially, right? Because there's these kits that are going there and they don't have to go to the store and reload and those types of things. They live in alignment, so they're feeling like uh, alignment. And then also an interesting one here is they comply with laws because one of the things that's interesting about this business model is the regulatory and the legal environment is going to be catching up with sustainability. And so municipalities, um, universities uh, are going to be shifting and, and requiring some of the things that we're talking about here. And so, um, and just to be clear here, that there's the customer segments are usually separated by colors, right? Because essentially what you do, we didn't do it for this one, we just sort of kept it simple. But what you do is that if, for example, we were gonna put a value proposition for a homeowner, which would be different than the renter, then we would put a yellow sticky here, right? And then, then we would write that value proposition here. So you can actually track several different customer segments within one business model canvas. Make sense so far? Awesome. Um, Anytime you have a question about anything, just interrupt us. Yeah. You can raise your hand too. <laughs> um, and so the next part is really identifying what channels and how you're going to basically reach them and, and, and essentially um, create awareness for the um, engagement and monetization. So how you're going to monetize uh, the, the service of the product as well. And so channels, traditional channels, does anybody want to you know, throw some channels out there that, that Social media, yeah. Radio. Radio, sure. Yep, absolutely. Ads on TV. Ads on TV. Could be like a brick and mortar store. I mean, there's many different ways to reach. Um, um, we, ha we know a guy that has a, a mobile van life guy who r drives around with product. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> So it's whatever, you know, what, however you're going to reach and, and, and start from this, this awareness and moving into engagement and monetization. So the revenue streams here are essentially, um, well, it's, that's part of what you guys are going to be working on is developing different revenue streams. Well, what might be an example no, of, no, no, oh, no, oh no, what, no, no, skip, skip. Oh, skippy, yeah, skip. Oh, okay, skip. we're going to the skippy. Okay, all right, we're staying for the workshop. Yeah, see, she just interrupts me. That's what she does. No, I'm just kidding. And so then, um, and so then the customer relationships are, are important as well because we want to identify the type of relationship that we have with these, uh, with these customer segments. So some of it might just be, oh, okay, it's a one-time, you know, gun and go, you know, it's a one-time service. Others might be that it's, you know, continuous and, and there might be a customer relationship that is educational, you know. So basically defining the most important piece of the customer relationship. They have a nice little heart here as their icon because it really is, okay, how are you tugging and, and what type of relationship are you building with each one of these, with each one of these um, uh, customer segments? So the interesting thing about the business model canvas too, yeah, sorry. What does the top one say on customer relationships? Automation, automation. So it's like maybe recur recurring orders. So you know, for example, on Amazon, you can buy once or you can get it delivered and it's cheaper if you buy it where it's subscription. Yep, exactly. Um, and so the interesting thing about the business model canvas as well is that everything on the right side is sort of, you know, revenue driven and, and um, sort of the positive side of the business, right? And on the left side, it's more of the, the cost side of the business. So usually what you do is you sort of paint the nice rosy picture over here and you talk about the revenue side and then you pull into some of the things over here. So for example, like key partnerships, you know, we talked about um, in a sustainability area, you know, working with government and, you know, potentially colleges and certainly brands to build and develop this marketplace. So for that, for example, with key partnerships, just given what we've shared so far about this, this brand or this, um, company, why would colleges be a key partner? Educate people about the, uh, the cause. Yeah, that's a good, that's great. What else? Back here. Um, colleges are usually on the forefront of like uh, innovation. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah, so getting like learning about solutions and, and things like that. Maybe um, building a 
relationship with dormitories and having packages like available for new students? Yeah, so think about when we're, we're thinking about just the simple things in a home and there's, that's like really simple living and so it's a perfect test environment for some of these products and those kits, which is really great thinking. What about government? Grants? Yeah, exactly. So helping to identify funds that are available for people to make these transitions in their lives. Yep. And then brands, that's pretty obvious. They're making the products, so. <laughs> and I will say this, it's, it's, this is the, um, just so you know, I mean, this is like a really clean business model canvas with not a lot of stuff going on. And I will say that one of the reasons why the client um, has agreed to share this is because um, there's nuance to their business model that they that they didn't want to share, right? And so this is sort of like the baseline stuff that they they were saying that was okay to get out there. Um, so so again, this is sort of the cost side of the business, and this is pretty self-explanatory. I mean, you basically want to look at um, you know key activities that might take up time and resources, key resources um, that you do require that obviously take up some money, and then, and then the cost structure around different areas of the business across the value chain. So the neat thing, I don't know if any of you know the website Strategizer. Does anybody know Strategizer at all? So it's a great, um, I, I should write it down because it's a brilliant site. If you are going to do a business model canvas, um, Strat. Uh, Jizer, I think is the, how you spell it. And um, what's his name? Alex Oleon. Uh, yeah, so he's the one that invented this, um, you know, like 15 years ago or so. And, um, and Strategizer is his company. And the coolest thing about it is it is, it's, I, I don't know, you know, there's probably a discount for students, but if it's only a few hundred dollars a year and you get to just plug and play all these different business model canvases, you can go in there. And the neat thing is, is that you can actually double click on a lot of this and create, you know, tests and revenue models and pretty much build an entire business into this with just a few clicks. So it's really great, especially when you start to test and validate some of your assumptions around the business model. Um, and then maybe what I'll do is one last thing, is share why this is so cool. Because if, it, if yeah, it's, it's cool right now because there's a bunch of colors and I like colors. But, um, but the, um, the, the reason why this is cool is because instead of having our 40 page business plan, now what we can do is we can say, oh, I think that, this, uh, that the value proposition here um, is, that is important for these um, consumers is that they live in alignment. And now what I can do is I can actually test that assumption. And I can move these things around and as I, I can plug and play and I can, as I learn things around my revenue streams or my channels that are working or not, I can basically have this flexible business model that I can then use in the real world and, um, and essentially start to grab some of these, throw them away, add new ones. And I, what happens is this business forms in front of you. And the neat thing, and, and one of the things I'll say about this business model canvas it saves startups tons of time and money. I mean, it's really the only way to do a startup as I'm concerned. So I'll say that again. This is the only way to do a startup as far as I'm concerned. This is absolutely the key tool to be successful in any uh, entrepreneurial startup. And the, the other side of it is it's so important and critical that large companies use it as well in any new business endeavor. And so what would happen, and I'll use an example for the, for the global work that we do, in helping brands go global, a lot of times the bigger organizations, they think big, they don't, you know, they're not as nimble, they're not as interested in learning, and they'll go spend a lot of money to go to Canada or China or Brazil, and all the executives will think just like it, they're selling in America. You know, even when they go do their market research, they might stay in a Marriott or a Hilton, right? And they're like not really in country. And so they'll spend a lot of money with a lot of the wrong types of assumptions, whereas smart companies, whether they're big or small, they'll go in there and what they realize is that when they're going into their new country or in this case their new market um, you know a new business they realize that they're at their risk they're at their highest um, uh, of risk and uncertainty right the highest levels of risk and uncertainty is when you're just starting out so instead what they do is they use the business model canvas and they'll do a little test here and they'll do a little test there and they'll spend little bits of money and they'll learn 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 and then what happens is that uncertainty goes down and as the uncertainty goes down, the risk goes down, and that's when they push the money in because now they've already tested these assumptions. They know how their business is going to run. So that's the, that's the fun part and the, and the really great part of the, of the canvas.
So I think what we're going to do now, and we'll come back to this and, and show you how we can make it a little bit more nimble around some discovery, and it helps to have a little bit of discussion. So we're going to break you guys up into um, four groups, and I don't know, I can't really do the math here, but I'm guessing it's going to be roughly around 10 people or so per group. Um, and I don't, you guys can sort of move um, your desks if needed just to kind of group together. Um, and we're going to give you a little bit of time if you want to click to the next slide. So basically what we're going to do is you guys are going to create um, for that model two to three revenue streams for this starter kit, right? So we're kind of, it's a little bit leading, I'll say, because we're calling it a starter kit. But you don't necessarily have to maybe buy the whole kit. Maybe there's levels of kits. Let's just say that. Um, but I want, I'm leaving it very vague so you guys decide that. So creating two to three different revenue streams for this business. Um, and then what would that appropriate pricing be? So really thinking about that. So have a discussion around that. Get each other's input. And you're going to come up with, with those. And then the next part about it is with the customer channel. So we mentioned back here we have social, obviously, email, there's radio. But getting into deciding what you think are the very best customer channels. And then I want you to take a little bit of a deeper dive on that. So not just what the customer channels are, but what would be some of the target markets in those channels? And how would you reach them? What would be some of the... Um, what would be some of the, the marketing tools that you would use and also, you know, language, copy, anything, anything that comes to mind to just kind of um, create this. And then the last part, and this is, you know, probably the most important, are what are um, at least one, but maybe up to three small tests that you can do out in the real world to test your assumptions around what you're putting on the model in terms of revenue and how you're going to reach them. Um, and, and then we'll actually talk through each of those tests and your guys' ideas and have a chance to share back. So are there any questions about what the assign? Yes. Yeah, so uh, for the benefit of those who came in a little late, yeah. please briefly tell about the product. Yeah, yeah so we'll go okay. back there for sure. Wait, wait, one more. OK. So, um, so for those that came in late, and maybe this is a good refresher for everybody just to, to understand. So. What we know the problem is, is that this company wanted to create a way for people to um, start living in a sustainable way in their day-to-day -day lives. And knowing that the problem is, is that sometimes people just don't know where to start. So we identified that the best way is in the home, and that's where we wanted to start. But how to do that was a little bit cumbersome. So the solution was to curate, because there's all these projects all over the world, right? So to curate a sustainable home starter kit, or at least a list of products um, for, the, for the, the products that are most highly consumed that generate the most waste. So that's the solution. And then this is just an example of what some of those items that were curated are. And so, and I just want to say, when you're creating your revenue models, I mean, obviously, nothing has to be precise. You can just basically pretend that you're out there, maybe, um, you know, creating the starter kit, what the pricing might be, how the testing and the channels. I mean, all of this is a little bit, you know, obviously using your imagination around some of this, but um, but really think deeply about, oh, okay, here here's you know the, the problem, the solution, and some of the products here, and how it sort of fits in. Yeah. And then this was the sort of general um, business model canvas. And so we're essentially filling in for here and here. And we're going to give you guys, I think, probably roughly around um, 15, 20 minutes in your groups to come up with this. You have a question? I forgot what revenue streams are. So this is the way that you would monetize the product. So if, we're, if we've curated this, this list of products. So, in the curation, one thing to mention is that because um, the product is sort of serv servicing up this curated selection, but what they've already done is the vetting. So they've ordered every single you know, toothpaste pod brand and vetted the ones that actually work and are actually packaged correctly and are actually solving for the problem, if that makes sense. So they've sort of picked. Um, one or two items in each of the categories that we listed of these highly consumable, repeatable 
um, products, and they've already vetted and curated that. So the product is how to service up this very like well curated list of products. And I'll give one little, um, I don't know, I say extra credit, but revenue streams, look at the whole canvas maybe when you're also creative, getting creative about revenue streams because there's different ways that, that this company could potentially revenue, not just based on, on product. So that's like, you know, just to open up your creative, creative mind around that. And we're gonna leave it on this slide because as you create revenue streams, you're welcome to bring in any other part of the canvas in order to do that. So for example, you may want to create a revenue stream that applies to each one of the key partnerships if you want. You don't have to. You could do it and you can just do it completely separate. Um, you may want to do revenue streams that focus on each of the value propositions or not. So it's just to give you ideas to be really creative with that. Okay, so we're hearing lots of really interesting ideas. It's great to hear you guys thinking about this. Um, did each group identify sort of one presenter? I took the yeah. notes, so I guess I Okay, so let's start with the group in the back. So um, just, okay, perfect. So let us know. We'll just start with um, the first part, revenue streams, your channels, and then you can talk through your tests. So uh, we thought about having a monthly refill subscription for our revenue stream. That was like our main thing. Um, within that, you could have different customer segments, like different kits that were targeted for like moms or college, because they would need different items within their kits. Um, and then our, that was our best revenue stream that we came up with. Okay. And then you want me so to... The re so they would be kits, but they would be like um, targeted kits based off of sort of what your day-to-day -day looks like. So yeah. for example, you know, maybe if you, if you don't clean your own home, then you don't need the cleaning products, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. You want me to talk about what yeah. next? Yes. What? Oh, sorry. So then the channels for those. The channels. Oh, we had... For that specifically, I mean ads on social media. Um, we had maybe like we could have flyers go out for a freemium for us to get the word out. Um, so say a little bit more about that. What would that look like? Um, what's your name? Again? Andy. So Andy. When you change your address online, you get like a bunch of like coupons and discounts. Yeah. You could also maybe get a sample of our, our subscription kit as well to your new address. So you're kind of starting fresh in your new apartment and you get this new case. Oh, great. So just a few like key items in that. That's perfect. So they would get like a little like a little light starter kit, and then if they liked that, then they could actually subscribe and get it maybe with a discount code or something. Cool. That's really great. Yeah. And then tests. Yes. Um, like a focus group, we could go say one of our groups is moms, one is college students, so we could have a focus group. With moms, what do you want in your kit? How much would you be willing to pay for your kit? Same with college students, a focus group. Like, what do you want in it? How much would you pay? Okay, cool. So that's a good, I'm really glad you brought up focus groups because an interesting thing is focus groups are awesome. You guys are essentially a little bit of a focus group tonight, right, um, for this product. And it's great to get minds together and do that. The idea with the business model canvas and with these tests is that they're in the real world. So you're going out there and getting actual feedback on the product and its value proposition. So just something to think about. It's always good to do test groups at some point in the development process. But what you really want to do is like send 50 of these little tiny kits to people like you were describing, these lean kits to houses and then track that somehow and see how many of those, those 50 kits actually ended up doing a subscription. That would be like a viable test in the market because it would be with an actual potential customer, right? Uh, we got a whole bunch. Uh, I don't know which one's the best one. Are we just doing one to you? So group? start with your, no, I mean, you can, 
Yeah. yeah, you can share all of them. So the revenue stream, we'll start with revenue streams and customer channels. Uh, Any details yeah. with that and then chat. One was uh, vendors. So we could use the vendor, such as a coffee shop, go down and tell the vendor, we're trying to become sustainable. It's a good uh, selling point for the youth and the market. So why don't you get rid of all your cups uh, that are trashable, buy our reusable cups, uh, customers come in, buy a cup of coffee. They can only use the reusable cups, so you can put that on the bill. And uh, returning customers would know to bring their cups. So you sort of build an environment where people are uh, encouraged to mm -hmm. reuse. And they start thinking about that. So you could advertise down at the coffee shop, more products like that, and uh, just sort of make it more accessible and easier for people to integrate into their life. Mm -hmm. uh, so. The revenue streams is like directly to the vendor you're selling to, and then to check how it's going, you know, look at the sales numbers, see how people are responding to it. You know, they could even they even bring a survey down there. Oh, for the test? Yeah. Okay. Or that, I mean, the vendor could be like, it's failing horribly, everybody's gone away. Uh... You've ruined me. So you, using the, Using, when you say vendor, like using a coffee shop as a way to engage an audience um, and use that as a place to sort of to sell. So would you advertise for the kits like inside the coffee shop? Is that what you're thinking? Sure. Well, I mean, I think cups were on the, on the list there. And you said that uh, the trash generated by coffee cups every day specifically. Yeah. So I thought that's a good uh, jump off point, a good platform to sort of build it into people's life, you know, like. This is our product, here it is, you're using it every day because you're probably gonna drink coffee or tea. Mm -hmm. Bring it down to the coffee shop, here's your uh, community. You know, It's a good way to start the day and uh, bring brand awareness. So then you could talk about the kits there or like put other promotional material. Cause there's usually like posters for local stuff going on. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a good uh, market for that. Another person brought up the idea of uh, when you stay at a hotel, we could uh, get the hotel to host the product or like little samples. So people come in, use our shampoo, use our toothpaste or whatever it is. And then they have like a card to leave with or the same thing with uh, airlines when you fly. There's a chance to sell or uh, suggest our products. So that was one. That's actually a good idea just to note that um, the hotel thing is because it's, it, it becomes experiential. So it's like you're not in your home, you're in this other sort of temporary home and to have an experience with some of these products. And then you, you couple that with the experience of maybe being on vacation or being away. And it, so that also feels good. And so there's an association with it and there's a curiosity and you capitalize on that experience and then bring that back home. And maybe that's a, a motivator. So that's a great thing to know. Also for the folks who are cleaning. Yeah. You know. And then, I mean, they're consumers as well. So the, the folks who work for the hotel and cleaning, and they get to learn the product, how to use the product, and they get to take that home and you know use that as well. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're usually a, a hotels are a great place to test and start with this particular product because <clears throat> it may, quite possibly the most highly. Um, cadence of consumables is in a hotel, more than a home, right? So they're going through things super quick. As Just as a note, the state of California just banned the little uh, ho uh, shampoo bottles and things. So in the next, I think they have, you remember what the regulation was? There's always going to be a grace period, but you'll start seeing it now if you go to a hotel in the, in the entire state. They're all going to have those sort of like dispensers, and they're, they're banning the small bottles, which is great. Also the straws in San Francisco. Paper now. Yeah, straws, that's another thing. The city of Berkeley has, um, for 2020 in January, outlined outline single use completely for cups. So that's going to be a really interesting thing to pay attention to. For revenue as well, well, we definitely talked about, we split it up between vendors and customers. So with the vendors, we would think about advertising because we would have a specific brand that we're using, you know, so let's say Jessica Alba. You know, her, you know, she has her lifestyle brand um, where she has all natural cleaning products and things like that. So, okay, well, we have a website. 
you know, where people go to to purchase our products. So, Jessica Alba, would you like us to advertise your products in specific? Um, so basically making money from online advertising, also advertising on collateral. So when we do like uh, in these uh, tests, like the hotels and the airlines and places like that, you know, we have on there like our um, collateral where it's like Jessica Alba's on it. Like, she sponsors this and mm. people who know Jessica Alba are like, oh my God, I love her products and I love Jessica Alba. So, you know, whatever that is, you know, that gives us more credibility. Um, brings more brand awareness to us as well as the products that we are serving. Yeah. Um, as well. So, and making money from that, also making money from each item that we sell to the customer, and making a percentage of that uh, from Jessica Alba. You know, like we sold your, you know, alternative Windex. So we're gonna make forty cents. Uh, you know, of the product that cost a dollar. Yeah. So essentially, using influencers as a as a possibility and and then um, just to clarify for the rest of the group so then basically what you're doing is for part of this curation of the products that we would have in these kits is using ones that already have strong followings and already have um, a viable business and then uh, using what it would be like called an affiliate program so if you we sold those on this site as part of the kit for every kit that's sold, we get X, Y, Z, you know, percentage from, um, I think her company's in, uh, in our honest company, isn't that what it's yeah. called or something? Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> also an affiliate program yes. for the customer. Yes. So for the customer who buys the products, then, you know, oh, well, my sister doesn't have this. I think it's great. Um, can I sign my sister up? And so the sister, like the first sister, would then get, you know, paid, uh, her box that the, that the new sister, a younger sister, um, purchases. So basically, they're making a little bit of money in a way. Um, like a referral. Yeah, like a referral program, mm -hmm. but we're increasing the amount of- You are talking about multi-level marketing, my yeah. friend. Yeah. If you have a big family, you can just retire. No, just yeah. you know. In my family, I could retire. I have a lot of sisters. <laughs> okay, so, all right, I like it. Any more tests from, your, the, from this group? You want to uh, share? I guess you have written uh, get data on, on the from the vendor side of yeah. things. We're talking about the. So I mean, apps. like a hotel would already have like feedback cards too. So mm -hmm. like that falls underneath the. You just add another level of feedback. Like, how do you like the products that you use today? Da da da. It's, it's sustainable. This is why it's good. Cool. Tell us what you think. Cool. Awesome. That's it from this one. Right. Uh, we could go on. Uh... <laughs> well, I think just to take that a double click, like what could you do to actually, instead of just getting feedback cards from the hotel, what could you do to actually validate like the extension of, of that consumer and what their behavior is? Does that make sense? Just giving them a code and see if they buy the product. And then tra uh, tracking them through that. Ding. Yeah. So they basically, they're putting their credit card in, they're actually buying the product. That's like the acceleration of a test. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So the, the key with the testing is that it's simple, very simple and very intuitive or easy. There's not a lot of explanation in it, right? So that's a that's a perfect example. Yeah. Also, if you if you do a, a premium at a hotel, um, you could track what items were taken home. Mm. Mm. Ooh, yummy. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool. Yeah, that's a good idea. I like that a lot. That's actually Yoga Club does that. Are these you know they send out models that that um, part of the data that's the best thing for them. Like um, what do they call like Birch Box or different things where they send out clothes. Subscription boxes. Yeah. yeah, they send stuff out, but you can send stuff back, and they're almost more interested about what you send back. Right. Mm -hmm. It's really good stuff. Okay. Great. All right. So group two. Awesome job. <laughs> All right. Next group. Is that this group up front? Right. Are you presenting? Yeah. All right. So our group got a little creative with um, first ideas as to what could go into this box. We have a few ideas. Um, so there are reusable towels. Um, you could have a mini solar panel, um, a water meter that um, clearly needs to be remodeled given how expensive it is. Um, 
So that's something to look into. Reusable battery chargers and natural air fresheners. Um, for revenue stream, uh, we thought about uh, camping, families, schools, hospitals, disaster relief, luxury apartments. Okay, so these would be customer segments, what you're what you were just outlining, but that's great. That's, yeah, that's really great. great. That's, that's great. excellent. No, it's perfect. But just we just want to be clear so we know what we're talking about. So those would be customers that would basically buy this. Correct? Yeah. Yes. Okay, that's good though. Keep going. This is good info. Okay. Um, Whole Foods and uh, a spa. Great. Okay. And then for um, channels. Uh, our first uh, our first idea was mailing things, and we got creative with packaging ideas. Okay. Um, so there are, for example, boxes that you can buy on Amazon. Um, they are just cardboard boxes, and then they have mushrooms inside. So um, if you could ship items in this box actually use the box as a way to grow your own mushrooms. Oh. Super cool. Do I keep saying that when I look at you? No, <laughs> That's awesome. So getting all the way down to the value proposition of even down to yes. the packaging and being methodical about how, you know, even down to that level makes them just a little bit different thinking in that way. That's really cool. Right. And also um, with the natural air fresheners, for example, it, it, it's actually just a vessel, right? So if um, if you want to ship a set of items, you could ship it within this natural air freshener. So just ways to avoid using um, traditional packaging. Mm. And when you do have to use traditional packaging, it should be compostable. Right. Um, we all agreed YouTube was a great source. Mm, that's awesome. Um, and also having an app. Okay. Um, which, for example, could, we had um, on here the, the water meter. So it can tell you exactly how much water you're using. Mm. Um, and tell you, oh, it's been a while since since you last ordered, would you like to place another order? So that's really good. So two really good, interesting things with that. One is the, the water meter, because that's also like a resource that we're using over and over again. We keep thinking about these tangible goods, but the water is used every day in the home. And so monitoring that and having some sort of like readout or information loop where you can know even just on your phone or something about how much you're using and monitoring, that's really smart. And then the other thing with the app is that it can start to be intuitive around maybe your own behavior. So it knows like, hey, for the last six months you've ordered toilet paper every three weeks and where it's like, you know, it's been three and a half weeks, don't you need toilet paper? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> Just kidding. But, um, so yeah, that's a really good thoughtfulness around that. I like that. Um, and for testing, um, we specified that we should be getting feedback, have them rank items, and we can use data that's available from this is like PG and E. Um, so tracking um, electricity use could be a way to better target who our customer, potential customers are. Mm. Um, offering premiums and um, being a sponsor, for example, of like an eco-friendly event where you can use these products as some sort of giveaway or prize. Mm, that's great. So going to where you know people that are already thinking in this way are in large masses and then capitalizing on that as a test market, that's great. And maybe even providing feedback in that, uh, 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 avenue for feedback in those experiences. I like that a lot. That's great, all right, nice yeah. job. Yeah. All right, well, we hope that was a fun opportunity for you guys to just get a little bit more acquainted with the business model. Um, We've, 
we love learning from all your ideas. Well, we're actually going to take a photo of all of this info and take it back to our client and just see how <laughs> it lands with them. So you guys are a part of something that's already living and breathing. Um, yeah. What's your ideas? We'll take them all back. <laughs> and that's what we do. We're the deliverer. But they're all, um, it's really interesting just to get more minds on it and see how people are thinking. Um, one of the things that uh, Vivian had asked us to do was also just, you know, provide a little bit of Q&A. I know this was a very specific example of one specific um, client or one specific company and what their business model is. But uh, we work with all different types of of companies. We work with companies that provide service, that don't have any tangible goods. We work with fitness companies. We work with nonprofits um, and all sorts of retail companies. And so if you guys have sort of questions about the business model canvas as it applies to that or maybe with that, you know, with one of your, um, with your projects specifically, if you guys have any questions, we're happy to answer those for you. Yeah. So what is like your guys' job title? Um, so we're, we are consultants, and so we work with, um, at the executive level of any kind of organization, regardless of what their business is, to help them make like strategic business decisions. And um, we do a little bit of coaching with them and help with their strategy and their planning and programs associated with that. We should have given you a little bit of our background. So, my background, uh, my undergraduate degree is in psychology and human behavior, and my graduate degree is in um, organizational behavior, which is really just like the human side of business. Well, yeah. I was going to say, um, in terms of service versus product, what do you think are some key differences or things to really focus on in doing a business model canvas on something like a nonprofit or uh, yeah, a service based? Yeah. Yeah, do you want to take that one? Sure. I mean, um, just in general with the difference between nonprofit and profit, there is, you don't really have to necessarily segment in a way for the business model canvas because nonprofits are there to monetize, you know, go through awareness, engagement, and monetization of the business, right? So it doesn't mean that they can't make money. It's just that the transfers of assets is, is treated very differently, right? Um, so, for example, the nonprofit that we're part of is a 501c6 organization, which is a membership organization. So a certain amount of the, of the revenue has to be based on a membership revenue stream, where there's actually members contributing to some sort of program, usually educationally focused. So that's sort of how we get into that, into that area, which is really nice because there's no taxes. It's great, you know. Um, but the other side of it is, you know, we're, gonna, we're not going to go sell it because you can't. Um, and so the difference between services and products, um, as you can imagine. Real quick, too, with, yeah. with, with the nonprofit, just to add on to that. So it is really clear, like a nonprofit can make money, but the biggest differentiator is just the parameters in which you have to work in. Like he was mentioning with that particular nonprofit classification, its membership model. So just knowing which percentage of your revenue needs to meet that. And once you know what those parameters are, you just work within them as you design this. So it, that's the only big differentiator. Yeah, I mean, the NFL as an organization is the same as 501c6, you know, but the individual teams are the profits and the members of the actual National Football League. So, um, and there's all sorts of parameters depending on the type of nonprofit. So you could be, you know, one that can lobby or can't lobby politically, you know. So there's, there's those distinctions as well. So like Jesse was saying, just a matter of knowing the rules of your particular nonprofit class. Um, in terms of the differences between product and services and working them within the within the business model as you can imagine it just changes um, I mean organically as you can imagine I think it just it just changes um, some of the resourcing and the cost side of things and obviously the creativity and understanding of of what it is when you're not providing a, a tangible good um, and how that changes just organically with you know the other side of the business model the interesting part is you know sometimes there's companies obviously that have both um, and have service models based on product as well, right? So it's like the, the great thing about the business model canvas is you might start out as a tangible good company and then you might realize, wow, we're a services company because you do the tests early, you know, because you realize some things that um, we haven't gone through. I mean, there's so many different, you can test anything here, 
right? So what would be another idea of a, of a test in the program that we just put out there that didn't have to do with uh, channels and revenue streams? Just if you could think of one. Like what would be a potential other test that you would have in this environment? Partnerships? Yeah, so to speak a little bit more to that. Um, you can see which ones you get like more like ROI, ROI from, or um, let's say colleges. Does it really suit your business? Um, let's say our. I, don't, I guess if I were to use that, I would be using it for this company in specific. Mm -hmm. So let's say, okay, well, if we partner up with colleges, are students really benefiting? Or are we, are we benefiting from students using these products? Or are they really enlightening uh, these students about our products and are they graduating and now spending their money as adults now on our products? And if they're not, then maybe that's not working. Mm -hmm. So maybe we need to look somewhere else. Yeah. That's perfect. And there's the, the thing I would stress is every single one of these you want to test. So it doesn't matter if it's partnerships, key activities, whatever. I mean, all of these are testable and at different levels of the game. You know, so partnerships you mentioned, maybe even very early on with colleges, it's like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call 10 colleges today and see if they have somebody that's sustainable. Da, da, da. That's a test. I mean, just like if you called 10 colleges and two of them were like, oh, my God, we got to see you because this and that. We're like, whoa, what just happened? You know, what a great test, because then it's like, oh, it's going to pull me closer to the colleges, right? So the yeah, fun thing is you can play. I just noticed that you have four value propositions. And let's say for my team, for the product that we are working on, it's just one value proposition. How do you go about, um, how do you go about finding those value propositions? You can, you can have one or you can have 10. Um, it, obviously, 10 would be a little bit excessive because you want to make it you a little bit more narrow. Um, in the beginning, sometimes uh, that's a really great point because in the beginning, oftentimes you'll just pick what is your number one value proposition. But what you'll realize through testing and evolving the product is that there are multiple value propositions. For example, um, especially when you get into service organizations as well. There's multiple things that become a value and you don't want to eliminate those and so you want to test against those and then you kind of figure out which one is resonating the most and edit. But it's not a, it's a, you always have to know at least one, but you can absolutely grow. Yeah. yeah. And I would add to that is that this is the beginning of the process. But if you look at most mature companies and you go talk to their sales teams, they're going to have a lot of unique strengths or value propositions. Like Jesse mentioned, they might have 20 of them. And then they map to their competition. And then they can see, oh, this is my competitor in this particular sales deal, let's just say. And this is, these are my unique strengths of how I want to sell to this client because I'm better than my competitor at that. So oftentimes, you'll see many different value propositions in mature companies. As a startup, you know, you put some of these on here, and the fun thing is, is this is your sandbox. You start testing and playing, and oh, this one's really popping, and we start to get a little bit better at that one, or this one's, you know, starting to, we're starting to understand a little bit more. The last thing I'll say about value propositions, most, a lot of companies today, let's just say brands and retailers, they're global the first day that they start selling because a lot of this stuff is on social media, right? So for Pure Place, for any of you that are in retail, and most of the time, your value proposition in the country that you're selling in, in your domestic country, is going to be very different than in Canada or in the UK or in Australia. And that's something that takes a long time for companies to figure out is their value proposition is not the same. We're out of time, guys. Thank you so much for your